Welcome to the wise view. Use our IQ to give you our point of view. Some things we thought you knew. Other things you believed in and found out it wasn't true. So me and my crew make it do what it do. We came to chop up game with y'all for a few. So take heed and get a clue. And check us out. The wise view. The wise view. The wise view. The wise view. Anytime the black man attempts to change the slave image, he will scare white people. It's such, it is going to come. The question is, will it take the form of the righteous indignation tied to love and justice, or will it take the form of raw rage tied to revenge and bigotry? The black man should control the politics of his own community, control the politicians who are in his own community. God is going to punish you if you don't stand up. For what is right. Uh, when we left off in 2015, because this is now 2016, and happy 2016 to all of you, and may you all have a blessed uh, forthcoming year. But when we left off, we were talking about uh, the need to belong, the uh, acceptance and being accepted by, you know, particular groups and the perception or the false perception of going along to get along with different groups of people uh, in an effort to experience, I guess, what you're looking for is forward progress, they'll call it. Um, but forward progress, uh, when you're riding on the coattails of others, uh, gets old after a while. And at the end of the day, you find yourself by yourself because when their reign, for lack of a better word, ends, so then does your ride. So when you establish uh, a self-concept that is grounded in your own mission statement, because we all should have a mission statement, a personal mission statement, one that does not um, make room for things that are not within the realm of our vision, then we can stay the course. See, and part of the problem is that we don't have a personal mission statement. We get on board with uh, missions uh, that do not really include us but we become laborers for others and we bring to fruition their vision and then when we see what their vision really is uh, then we become blinded with anger with deceit and then we begin to take a position of uh, being at odds with one another and then we're separated once again. And that is something that's pretty consistent uh, in the black community. There are always means to divide and means that we create ourselves. Uh, means that we can actually avoid if we just put things out on front street and be up front and direct with where we stand with certain things. Because at the end of the day when you go along to get along and then it comes time for you to voice your opinion your voice falls upon deaf ears. It really does. And then you stop talking to people. Then you stop seeking resolve for what it is that you could have. You could have taken control over and did something about while it all unfolded right before your very eyes. Because you participated in it. And you knew how dirty the individual was that you were working alongside but because they knew somebody because they were part of something that you perceived as being significant to your forward progress you went along with it but you already knew how dirty they were see you already knew that so because I don't go along to get along I find myself operating independent but there's always somebody who comes along 
who has a similar way of doing and thinking as you. And you just have to wait that time out. But in the meantime, you continue to build on your own personal mission. And you bring to life your own vision. And you keep staying that course. And in time, you'll see where those others are in their lives. Okay? So that's real important to understand. So, uh, there are a lot of things uh, that have happened since the last time uh, we spoke. But I want to follow back up on a couple of things that I discussed in the first episode of America for Color Zone. One of the incidents I talked about that happened involved a police officer, a white police officer in a school who literally snatched a young black girl out of a chair, slammed her to the floor, slung her across the floor, and not only uh, was he not dealt with uh, in a manner that we find to be most appropriate, but the young girl who took the videotape of it was actually charged with the crime as well. Okay? So, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time delving into social injustices upon black people because we're, we're addressing those. Uh, we have you know, organizations that are taking the initiative to keep the foot on the pedal uh, in order to bring to light and keep bringing to light and keep confronting uh, this issue in America. Uh, but what I do want to uh, speak to in terms of that is really ask a question um, as to what has changed in that school. Uh, have parents become more actively involved in the home and school association meetings? Have parents become more actively involved in any uh, of the, uh, the committees uh, that are within the school? that school or the school district itself to address the need to change policies regarding police officers in those schools. Are parents getting more actively involved to get to know their teachers? Because again, we had a black teacher, a black male teacher, who stood by and watched while this took place without uttering a word without uttering a word about the wrongdoing that was taking place with this police officer. He said nothing. He said absolutely nothing. Has he been spoken to? Has he even spoken about the matter? Or is he more preoccupied with the idea of keeping his job than speaking to what, what is wrong? Because see, this is not necessarily about black versus white. This is about wrong versus right. And he should have said something. We all agree to that. But what has he said and what has he done since that incident? And that's one of the many unanswered questions which will probably continue to go unanswered because it's been overshadowed by a plethora of continued police violence upon blacks. But we need, to, we need to really confront that. We need to take a look at that. And we need to take a look at what it is that we're doing. And not just that school, but in schools across the country where police do exist within the schools, for one. For two, that the potential for violence is very high in our schools. Hence the reason why there are police officers in the schools. What are you sending your children to school with? How many times are you making surprise visits to the school to see what your child is doing in the school? Because one of the things that was also talked about was the disrespect that the child was showing towards the teacher in the school. A black girl showing a black adult male disrespect by doing whatever it was that she was doing in school. And no, I'm not disregarding what the white officer did, but this is not what I'm talking about right now. What I'm talking about is responsibility. What I'm talking about right now is accountability. Something that we continue to avoid taking in many situations. In many situations. 
We don't look, not, not only do we not look at how we talk to others, especially when it comes to uh, interacting between uh, non-blacks, be them white, be them Asian, be them uh, Indian, be it whatever, whatever they're, it, we have a problem talking to ourselves with respect, to one another with, with respect. We automatically go into these, 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 these modes of attitude. You know, listen, I can be, I, listen, I'll be the first one to tell you that at some point in time in my life, when my perception, my world view, was uh, pretty much uh, skewed because of a lifestyle that I was living at the time. And as I began to fall more into alignment with what is acceptable, right so has changed my behavior and how I interact with law enforcement every cop is not dirty therefore I can't interact with every cop you know in the same capacity as one who has imposed some wrongdoings upon me I had wrongdoings imposed upon me as a kid back in the 60s by white officers when the police department was pretty much dominated by white males as years have gone by you know, more diversity be, be, became to uh, come about within police departments. But in the early, uh, the, the, the 60s, uh, well into the early 70s, there weren't a lot of black police officers. So I was already exposed to uh, the, the uh, injustices, social injustices of white officers upon blacks. I mean, we had officers who were drunk, I mean, literally drunk on the job, rolled up on us you know, frisking us, harassing us, calling us all kind of names and everything else. You know, so I've, been, I've experienced that. But that didn't change my perception of other whites. Nor did it lead me to being a hateful person, a person who hated others because of their skin color. It was the lifestyle that I chose along the way that caused me to respond and or react to situations that involve law enforcement. Now, no, again, I'm not saying that there aren't injustices where there, there are situations that have taken place, you know, involved uh, with police involved situations where the person in fact was appropriate in their responding to the situation. I'm not saying that. Okay, so if you want to take and run away with the fine, make that argument, hence again, that's part of the problem. We don't listen to what's being said, we listen to what's not being said and want to say it for somebody to add clarity to our own thinking instead of listening to what their person is and being clear on what it is that they're saying. What I am saying is that once I stop living that lifestyle and I stop having that world view, that vision of violence and all kind of other mayhem that was going on and that's the way I saw the world, things begin to change as to how I saw, how I needed to interact in the situation. So that way at the end of the day, I could go home and that officer could go home to, to the family, their, our families. But the other part to this is, is the, the ongoing disrespect that our children have in schools. And they're very, they're very disrespectful. I visited elementary schools and have been there to engage the children about positive uh, things uh, and just, it was just ridiculous the behavior that I saw from elementary level uh, of children. I've been to middle schools, I've been to high schools and you know what? It, it, if you close your eyes and walk through these, these buildings, if it wasn't because of their voices, you would really not be able to tell what environment you were in. Some of the language that is heard, the behaviors that, that, that are, are shown, you know, towards adults is ridiculous. It's pathetic. It is. And it starts within the home. So when we keep bringing up all of these issues, and every time I, I look up, I'm hearing one more comparison to, well, whites aren't treated this way, well, this group is not treated that way, and that group is not treated. Let's start with how we're treating ourselves. Let's start with that. Okay, because this, this is really the primary focus of what's happening for blacks in America. 
All right? It's not what's happening with whites upon blacks in America. It's what's happening with blacks upon blacks in America. Because that's the issue that I'm dealing with on most occasions. On most occasions. 98% of the incidences that have been negative upon me in my life have, not, have, been, have been by blacks, not whites. So let's get it straight. Now, we can sit down and we can read the newspaper, we can watch, we can watch television, everything in the media will show that 98% of what happens in America negative is black. They won't show you the other side because it's not by design that way. That's not how the system is set up. When you make up 13% of the world population, of the population, excuse me, the population in the United States, the expectation, let me say this, the expectation is that one group of people is going to be exploited. Well, black folks are the largest major minority in the United States. Therefore, they're next on the list. So therefore, they're going to be the targeted people, period. They're going to be the targeted people, period. Next to Latinos, right? Next, they're Asians. But it was a point in time in America that the Asians were the targeted people. I was just watching this movie um, yesterday. And, uh, the title of the movie is Little Boy. Just watch it. I'm not even going to tell you about it. But what I am going to tell you is that it was, it, it was, first of all, it was a wonderful movie. But it showed you how hatred is so easily spread because of people's perception of other groups of people and a lot of these things come from wars. We have we have this increased uh, uh, um, uh, push for uh, attacks upon Islam. Now, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. I am a Muslim. I do not condone anything that ISIS or any of these other so-called so-called radical organizations represent. There's nothing in the Quran that tells me to do any of these things that these folks are doing. And none of these things that they're doing is in the Quran. Therefore, these are not radical Muslims. This is not radical Islam. It's a bunch of individuals who are radical in their own thinking and want to use Islam as a basis for their actions. Not so. Not so. Period. But as long as you continue to identify a group of people as being an enemy in any capacity to any so-called American, then they are defined across the board as the enemy to all of us. And that's, that couldn't be further from the truth. In this movie, in this movie, excuse me, there was a Japanese man. Persian had gone off to war. He was killed in the war. They were fighting Japan. The war ended. Japanese man moved on, moved into a community, predominantly white community. One of the persons whose family member was killed in this war saw the Japanese man, lost it, assaulted him, so on and so forth. And then the whole town was also inflicted with that thinking. The entire town. It's the same thing that happens every day. The same thing that happens every day. It happens within our own practice. Muslims against Muslims. Christians against Christians. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Within, we're not even talking about outside of the black community. We're talking about within the black community. Right? And we're talking about, you know, what happens throughout with all of us. How we don't come to one another's defense and make it plain. But we make those people our enemies. We make those people our enemies. So now every, not every time you turn the news on, what do you see? You see a person of color be it a black person or a brown person. That's all you see. Now many of these people have never even had any contact. So they think. 
with these particular groups. But you see them every day. You go to the doctor, you go to the hospitals, you go to the dentist, you go to schools, business, and touch and these people all the time. But as soon as the news comes on and shows you that these people are Muslim, and they're a, they're a part of this, you automatically lump them all together, so all the kindness that you have seen from them doesn't even matter anymore. Now you hate them. That's how weak-minded you are. That's a weak-minded person. See, only weak-minded people allow somebody to put something on in, uh, on television or on, in social media or anywhere else and allows them to believe that they're hateful towards you. I don't, listen, truth be told, I don't believe any of this stuff exists. I believe this is all propaganda. This is all just made up to, co to cause hate in America. To keep wars going on right here on our own soil towards one another that's what I believe now if you choose to sit down and let them put something on television and you come away from it believing it that's entirely up to you but I guarantee you I can go online and cut and paste a whole bunch of photographs of people of all different groups and put them into a, a, a story and tell you something negative about these people and you'll make two, you'll, you'll make two choices to tell me, one, that I don't know what I'm talking about, right, and disregard it, or two, you'll take the information because you, 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 for whatever reason, believe that maybe I could be right, and you take and you run away with it, and then you repost it, and then somebody else takes it and reposts it. They read it. They put their own little, their, their own little piece into it. And before you know it, people have taken sides. Some are in agreement, some are in disagreement. But at the end of the day, it's a story. It's a story. Somebody is going to believe it. Somebody is going to believe it because they have been conditioned to believe a particular thing about a people or a group of people. In episode one, that's one of the things that I talked about. I talked about definitions. And I talked about definitions from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And I talked about how those definitions are not consistent. Not consistent with what many of us have been led to believe. Hence the reason why it's important for you to read and get definitions for yourself of words. Get definitions for yourself. Right? So, now we have Bill Cosby been arrested. Now, right, wrong, or indifferent, agree, disagree, that's not my position here. My position is this. You have Bill Cosby who has been arrested. Now, automatically, there's comparisons. Well, this person did this, nothing happened to him. That person did this, nothing happened to him. Here's a black man, this is what happens to him. We automatically go into that mode. But, nobody is taking the position that needs to be taken. Right? And the position that needs to be taken here is, this is not about a black man, or a white man. This is about a man who has allegedly committed a crime, but also a man who has also copped to doing some things, right? Therefore, once you cop to doing some things, right, everything is fair game that comes at you. Everything. But the only thing that so many of us seem to ride on is we want to make a comparison to Bill Cosby and whites who have done things of late when that's not even the issue. And again, this is where our focus tends to always go. We don't seek to improve as a people. We seek to improve other people, want to tell other people how they need to improve their lives and how they need to do this for us and that for us instead of continuing to improve ourselves. Improve ourselves. Improve our own conditions. Right? Let me add one more thing to that. The R. Kelly situation. Now, R. Kelly, this goes all the way back to Aaliyah, from what we know of his involvement with uh, young, young girls. That's, that, those allegations have been made for years. Now, all of a sudden, it becomes a, big, a bigger thing. And now you people want to 
begin to say things, well, you know, that you're going to stop buying his music, you're going to stop supporting him, so on and so forth, and it just goes on and on and on. If you remember way back when, it was the same thing with Michael Jackson, the allegations with him and child molestation. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. But, in the same breath, right, check this out now, you want to part ways and you want to blast all these people, but you don't want to blast any of these athletes in your city who have million dollar contracts who put absolutely nothing back into that community. Nothing. You don't have, you have absolutely nothing to say about these, these actors who come out of your city, right, who put absolutely nothing back into the community, right? All these sport teams that are in your city, who you patronize by going, you patronize by, you go to those, those stadiums and you spend six dollars for a damn pretzel, right? For an eight-year-old kid who wants to see a professional game, eight dollars, right? For a pretzel, twelve dollars for a hot dog, right? There's more bun than dog, and you're paying twelve dollars for it. But overall, is that is that a family the family environment? It costs you almost two hundred dollars to take you, your 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 wife, and a child or two to a game. Then you have to sit around some drunken behind people who are just just disorderly, rude, downright obnoxious, and sometimes violent. But they got new stadiums. And they tell you this is for you, and you believe that the stadium is for you. It's not for you. It's to accommodate the people so they can make millions, billions of dollars. But going back to my point, you have entertainers, you have athletes, you have recording artists who come from our cities who don't put anything back. But every time they drop an album, you own it. You own it. Now, I'm not talking about performing. I'm talking about buying it. You're rocking their music loudly in your cars. You're promoting their stuff. They're not putting a damn thing back into our communities. All these damn designers who came out, who told you that their clothing line were not for black people, that they didn't care nothing about black people wearing their clothes because that's not who they were meant for. You continue to go out and buy. You continue to go out and buy. You continue to go out and buy. Let's talk, let's talk about something else while we're talking about it. Online, right? And this is something that is not new to me. But do you know it is anticipated? Check this out. Let me read this to you. There are 43 million African Americans in the United States. 13.7 of the total population. The second largest racial minority in the country, right? The median age is 32 and 47 percent are under 35 years of age. Now this is, now I want you to just take that number and I want you to look at who is buying all this music. Who is really the, 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 the ones that are spending money going to these games, buying these tickets to see these entertainers, going to these shows. I want you to look at that, right? Hold on now, because I'm not finished. I want you to look at something else here, because this is real important information. Hold on. Now, let me, let me read something to you. Because I want to tell you how much money is spent. How much money, look, African Americans buying power projected to be 1.1 trillion dollars by 2015. 1.1 trillion dollars. Now, here's a fact. Despite our collective buying power, little of our money stays in the black community or is spent on black owned businesses. The NAAC, the NAACP reports currently a dollar circulates in Asian communities for a month. In Jewish communities, approximately 20 days. 
and white communities, 17 days. In the black community, the dollar circulates for six hours. Within six hours, that dollar that you spent is gone out of your community. Within six hours. Six hours. You really need to think about that. There was a conversation that was had uh, between a couple of individuals who I choose not to name, but it's an interesting story. I mean, and I'm going to tell you what makes it so interesting. Here's the headline. Jewish businessman calls black people liquid money because we give it all away. And he speaks to the very same thing. He replied, we call you liquid money. The same way that water falls out of a man's hands, money typically seeps out of a black person's hands in the same way. Your community gets money and immediately gives it all away to people who aren't black. We see that as a huge business opportunity. See, when we sit down and we complain, about so-called white injustices when it comes to financial power amongst blacks. You're not making any sense. See? Let's look at it from this perspective. Right? We have black businesses in our communities. Very few of them. Very few of them. But I can remember vividly walking through the black community and going to mom and pop stores in the black community. All those stores now are owned by Asians, Latinos, and others. Right? We sold all those stores. We sold all of those stores out to those people, right? You got an extra forty, thirty, forty thousand dollars for that property, if that much. I'm just giving it to you because I'm sure that they came with a nice, hefty price, but they already knew that that was going to be a lifetime investment, so it didn't matter. And they also already knew that that which they gave you, you were going to give right back to one of their stores anyway. One of the stores anyway, so it really didn't matter. But when you look at the opportunity to buy buildings within the black community, nonprofits can take ownership of buildings, for profits can take ownership of buildings, and you just buy and you build and you rebuild your own community, and the money stays there. You go into Chinatown, because Chinatown is also talked about in here, and it talks about how uh, the black community needs to take a page from uh, uh, how Chinatown, how the Asian community built Chinatown, and how they keep the money within the whole business district, that that money keeps keeps on going around and around and around within their business district. What it, one, here's an article, it's an article that says three lessons the black community can learn from Chinatown. Now this is Chinatown in Chicago, but there, there's also a Chinatown in Philadelphia, and I'm sure it's probably Chinatowns everywhere else. But here's one of the things that they talk about here. Everyone, now it's three, now it said three things. So the first one is, everyone is welcome to visit, but they are not welcome to stay. Huh. The lesson, stop letting everyone into your community. Yeah, I know that things are much deeper than this, and race, class, and politics have a lot to do with much of it. Just know that other people cannot take over if they cannot get in. That's number one on the list. Other people cannot take over if they can't get in. Okay? 
So yeah, there are a whole lot of other variables in that, but you don't let others in. You set up shop, you keep bringing your own in, right? Number two, Chinese money stays in the Chinese community. Stays in the Chinese community. Now we're talking about Chinatown, mind you. Don't, don't start saying, well, Sabir, you just said that, you know, uh, in the Asian community, you know, the money stays this. In the Asian community. We're talking about Chinatown. Okay, so we're talking about a black business district. So it goes on to say, the lesson for number two, spend your money with black owned businesses and employ other black people. I know this is easier said than done on so many levels, but if you can find good, reliable help, hire them. And it was a time when uh, our men would come home from prison. This is back in the 50s, the 40s, 50s, 60s, as early as it, probably in the early 70s. You know, our men would come home from prison and they would be able to get a job. Somebody would be able to like look out for them, keep an eye on them, help them out a little bit. You know what I'm saying? They would be able to get a room somewhere because there were a lot of room in houses back then when, when, you know, when the men came home from prison. They, get a you know, room and go ahead and get a little, little job, you know, helping at the barbershop, helping at the store, you know, whatever it was that the, they were doing, but they were able to earn the key. And that has changed. So, you know, but you, you can bring people in, you get our youth to come on in and, and teach them how to earn. I was taught how to earn money early on. My uncle had me, you know, out exterminating houses. I think I was like 10, 9, 10 years old. Showed me how to pump the thing up, fill it up, get a fold, and how to spray along the wall. and not to spray it all over the curtains and stuff, but I was always, you know, working. The work ethic is important. But also when we have so many of our, our black males who are incarcerated, who, you know, are coming home to nothing, you know, there's opportunity that we need to be creating for them to stop looking around for somebody else to create it on city, state, or federal level. That's our responsibility. Take care of our own folks. They do it. Asians do it, Latinos do it, whites do it, everybody does it except us. We walk around with our hands out and when we can't get when we can't get what it is that we want, then we take another approach, which is always the approach that puts us right back in prison. Right back in prison. Number three on the list says they control their own media. The lesson? Create and control your own media. Tell your story with accuracy and honesty to counter mainstream media images and stories. Free social media tools are available. Or report your stories to bloggers, social media gurus, and other online community influencers who care about your community. Ideally, the people telling your stories will live in the communities in which they are reporting in which they are reporting. Anybody can do a blog. Anybody can do an online. I did I did an online, uh, what I call an easing, you know, which I was circulating to people. While I would gather information of things happening in the community. Good, positive things. You know, our, our, some of our own black media, uh, you know, does the same thing in the community. You put out negative things. Everything should be positive about the black community. We see enough in mainstream media, you know, that that is killing us. And that is also aiding in supporting that which is in the newspapers that is incorrect and inaccurate about who we are as a people. Period. We don't need to invest time, energy, effort in putting out the same damn thing somebody else is already putting out. But it's easy to do. You can send me yourself. I was walking around and, 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 and to people's events. I was taking pictures. I was doing little little video shorts. And I was coming home and I was writing stories about those events. But that didn't happen back to me. Nobody else was doing that. Nobody else was coming and, and taking pictures of my event. Well, I had one. Baba Shipman. Thank you. Let me, let me, let me clarify that. Uh, Baba Shipman uh, was, was actually uh, coming through and he was taking you know, some shots, interviewed me and, and, and you know, did some, some things, but 
you know, people who I was actually doing business with on a regular basis, they weren't pulling out a camera and posting pictures of me, you know, uh, attending their event, participating in their event on their webpage. But I was doing it for everybody else. I was having an annual event. I was inviting everybody else to come participate in my event. I didn't care if you had you was offering the same services, similar services. It didn't matter. This job is too large of a job, you know, that one organization thinks that it can capitalize on it uh, and become the, you know, monopolize on everything that was taking place in the area of fatherhood. It doesn't happen that way. You have a, you have a waiting list of 17 people and I'm down here starving. All I think I have is five and you can't send people my way? What sense does that make? But that's how we operate. And we have to stop operating in that capacity. We have to stop operating on envy. On, on ego, let me you know, uh, 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 on an unmanaged id, because that's what it is. An attitude of self-righteousness, you know, those things that have been put in front of us to, to tell us that they are things that should divide us, that we allow to divide us, and you know, divide and conquer, that's how that happens. But that's, we need to stop all of that. This is, this is proven. Everybody else around us is doing it. Everybody else around us is doing it. Everybody else around us is, is building. We're the only ones who want, you know, we want like to, to have somebody drop millions, billions into our hands and give us reparations for something. We, we're never going to get it. We're not going to get reparations for nothing. These folks don't care about us in that capacity. We need to care about ourselves and start working hard about, you know, with unifying with one another and building from that capacity. Stop walking around like, like we need to get a damn handout. It might have given us anything. Really. Just work for it. Put yourself in alignment so that way when opportunity comes, you, you, you can get it. Period. But this whole, this whole, I want to say this and we'll move on. This whole situation with this Bill Cosby thing blowing up like it is right now comes at an opportune time. Opportune for what? I don't know. But it's a diversionary tactic to keep us unfocused from what's coming down the pipe. There's other things that are happening that are going to show up. Now, I know the primaries are coming up, the May primaries. We're going to have a whole lot of, uh, uh, we got the, the, the convention that's coming to Philadelphia for the first time. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things happening. We need not be diverted. At the end of the day, whatever's going to happen with the Bill Cosby case is going to happen. We need not be diverted. We need not be diverted from what these folks are doing in the Supreme Court. Right? There are a lot of laws that are being passed. And it's being slid right through and you're not paying attention to it. There's a whole lot of things happening. They're going to affect people of color. They're going to affect nonprofit organizations. That's going to affect people who have uh, substance abuse challenges, mental health challenges. Soon you're not going to be able to get help. What's happening in our schools? It's a whole lot of things happening. Don't fall for the banana in the tailpipe again. We need to stop doing that. We need to stop allowing things to happen all around us because we're diverted by something else. This Bill Cosby thing could, could have jumped off a long time ago. It's coming now for a reason. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Um, and, and on the whole buy black thing, I'm going to finish up on that as well. You know, I, I was talking to my wife the other day and I was like, I was on one of my rants and I was saying, everybody keeps talking about buy black, buy black, buy black. You know what? I've seen some really nice black artwork. I'm, a, I'm an artist. I'm a black artist. I'm not a black art artist. I'm an artist, but I'm black. But, you know, when I was talking to her about buying black art, I said, there was, there's some nice pieces of black art that I've seen. But I said, well, like, why I got to spend like a $500 for a, 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 a eight and a half by eleven or, or a eighteen by twenty two picture of black people, I go get a camera and walk around the city and take a picture of all my people all day long and put that on my wall before I go out and pay five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars for a piece of work. I, hell, I'm trying to make a car payment. I'm trying to get a place to live. I can't afford to drop that kind of money. Listen, I'm as an artist, I'll make prints. 
I'll make prints that are affordable for people to buy. You know, put them in nice, reasonable, reasonably priced frames and sell them for a reasonable price so everybody can afford to have one in their house. Yes, there are some pieces that I have, the pieces that I have that are originals. I'm not selling my originals right now. But if I was to sell an original, I, you know, I'm sure I'll take some bids on it. But if I want my work to be in everybody's household, if I want my stuff to get around, if I want to establish a regular income, that's the way to do it. Not, not get rich. So I can take pictures of my people if I want some black art. Listen, with all due respect, some wonderful artists out there, but I've seen artwork that is ridiculously priced. It's a mortgage payment. It's a car payment. And then you say, okay, well, it's not for you then. That's not the point. If you want me to buy black, if you want us to buy black, if you want us to establish a flow of income, make prints. I have a Nikon uh, 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 D3, D3, 1300, whatever the heck I got this, and I photographed it. I made the lighting the best I could, and I photographed it. And then I took it, I took it, and took it. I took it and, uh, you know, um, edited it and, you know, cleared it up as much as I could, you know, and bring the lighting right on it uh, in, in the, with the software. And they're all JPEGs now. Matter of fact, one of my pictures is on my, my credit card. And, and people look at it and they're like, wow, that's really nice. And people are like, wow, you should be a tattoo artist. But what my point is this. It's got to be affordable. It's got to be affordable. We'll go to 7-Eleven and buy a bottle of ketchup for $2. That same bottle of ketchup that's available in the store for $0.89, cents, $1.29. Cents. When we were going to a lot of those corner stores around our community, we were always paying more. Hence the reason why people were going to the market or other places. My point is this. When you shop together, because when you find that all these, these stores in Chinatown, they get trailers and they shop together. They put down at their list and they buy this stuff in large bulks. They go to BJ's and buy stuff and they resell it to you. We need to begin to think differently on how we do business. Stop running around saying buy black, buy black, buy black. And then it seems that whenever we go to buy black, buying black means spending more. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Somewhere along the line, we've, we've convinced ourselves that when because we're black that we need to charge more. Because we're black, because you won't get it from anyone else, because we're black, you can only get it from black. How about making a product that just is equally as good and not try to become a damn millionaire off of it? How about that? How about that? And nobody wants to talk about that. I found many products that, 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 that are being sold by blacks that are equal products, but higher in cost, because you're black. Come on now. That's why you're not making any money, because you don't understand business. That's not business. That's not business. That's greed. That's arrogance. That's what that is. It's you taking advantage of your own people and then cry foul when those outside of us do the same thing. The last, the last thing um, is this. You know, hate is capable of doing anything. And I want you to, I want you to, I want you, for those of you who use Facebook, who use Instagram, who use Twitter, hashtag hate is capable of doing anything. Hashtag hate is capable of of doing anything. When they talked about these churches being burned in the south, you know, right off the top of my head, the first thing I said to my wife was, I guarantee you, they're going to find that somebody black is behind the burning of some of those churches. What happened? An arrest was made. Uh, a few months back, black male behind burning the churches of some of the churches, about all of them, it's still an investigation, but it was a black male. Just recently, 
a master, uh, was, uh, there was an, an arson issue, a case. Come to find out, the person who committed that, the crime, a Muslim, a black Muslim, who attended, who was there, who said he went there five, he went there uh, uh, every day, five times a day, made prayer there, started a damn fire there. We need to be real careful. When we start jumping on these bandwagons, when people do things and they give you the, they want to give you the impression that somebody black did it, that somebody white did it, that a Muslim did it, that a Christian did it, whoever did it, stop jumping to conclusions. Stop jumping on these bandwagons because hate is capable of doing anything, even if it means stirring up the pot. See, when I know that I can stir up the pot because it's already being stirred by the media, the media got it in a blender. They're not stirring it. They got this thing going liquefied. That's what they got this hate on, liquefied. They got this thing just going full blast, man. Hate, 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 hate. They don't have to put Donald Trump in the news. This is part of the hate. This is part of the liquefying of hate. See? And you need to get, get, get with the program here because that's what this is about. All this hateful rhetoric that's going on within the, uh, the, the Republican and the, the, and the Democrats too. But mostly coming from the Republicans. This hate that is, that's, that is in the blender, man, that is just kind of circulating around the world. It's pulling everybody in. It's just like a tornado. It's like a hurricane. It goes around and around and around and it pushes things all out the way. But then right in the middle of all of it is everything you see, all the debris, you look up. And, and that's what hate is doing right now. That's what hate is doing right now. And we keep jumping on these bandwagons. And as soon as something happened to a, a black person, you know, uh... And the first thing we want to do is you want to throw race into it. And then as soon as something similar happens to a white person, the first thing we want to do is you want to throw hate into it. You know, these are individuals making a decision based on their own consciousness or lack thereof. But that doesn't mean that we have to turn towards every other white person or every other Asian person or every other Latino person and start hating them or every other black person to start hating them because of the actions of others. That's what the intent is. That's what hate does. That's what hate does. Truth be told, all of us are on the same path in some way, shape, form, or fashion. But didn't Satan say that he's going to get on that path? Satan doesn't need to take another path. He already has soldiers on that path. Satan wants to be on the path of the righteous. Because those are the ones that he promised that he will pull down. He promised that he will prove it. That these people are not disciplined. They are not dutiful people. They are not servants. They care about materialism. And I'm going to whisper in their ears. And I'm going to pull them. Of course. That's what hate does. That's what hate does. So when you make a decision to watch television, to pick up a newspaper, to pick up a magazine, to go on social media, and somebody tells you something negative about a person, a group of people, or about a culture, and you take and run with it, you are small-minded, you are weak, you are coward. Because it's showing that you lack independent thinking. The free will that God has given you. That's what you demonstrate. And you're held accountable for that. See, when you stand before God in the end, you stand before him by yourself. And there's an angel on each side that has recorded your good deeds and your bad deeds. Your grandmother, your aunt, your mother, little boo-boo, nobody's standing next to you and saying, no, nah, no, nah, I'm telling you that's what he did. It's already being recorded. That's your punishment that you have to live with. That's your punishment that you'll have to live with. And if you're willing to be punished for the rest of your life, after this life, because of what you failed to do, that's on you. I'm not willing to do that. 
Therefore, I stand on the side of right. Not self-righteousness. Not self-right. But I stand on the side of what's right. Hate involves too much energy. Too much negative energy. It's draining. It's overwhelming. It's overbearing. And it's certainly overrated. So for those of you who choose to walk around and look at another person and you think that you're looking at them from a superior lens, you're actually looking through an inferior lens because you are afraid of that person. You are afraid of that person and you don't want to say it. And the fear is not that they're going to do anything to harm you, but the fear is that they will soon become the majority within your own mind, within your own vision, within your own community. Within your own reality. Within your own reality. I'm not afraid of you. You can't kill me. See? You can only kill something that does not go on after its, its, its initial death. I'll go on after this. This is just a physical being. This is just a human uh, a being that you are looking at. You're not looking at my soul. My soul will go on. This is but a trial. This is temporary. I don't fear for my life. I fear no man. None. All I'm saying to you is you need to think for yourself. You think for yourself. Stop running around engulfed in hate and animosity and deceit. Start thinking for yourself. Start using the free will that God has given you and make a better decision starting right now. What are you going to do to improve your community? Because America is made up of communities. Regardless of how diverse your community is or is not, America is made up of communities. Therefore, you need to focus, we need to focus on building, rebuilding our communities.